Yes, ma'am. All right. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day. We thank you because you are all-knowing God. You are wise God. And Father, we pray that we follow your counsel, your instructions, that we show love as Jesus showed love to the world. And you forgave us in our sins and father we thank you and bless you and you're everything to us and i pray that this meeting goes smoothly and that we honor the work has gone before us if there are any changes that need to be made that we be that it be made respectfully and that we respect each other and our staff father we ask you to Look over them, yes. to cover them, yes. and let them know that we appreciate them yes. wholeheartedly yes. for all the hard work that they do. And each council member, a mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, council member, Banks McLaughlin, she's not here today, but look over them and bless them as well and bless our families. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And good afternoon, council. Uh, our mayor and our mayor pro tem are away doing business for the city of Fayetteville. Councilwoman Banks McLaughlin is not feeling well, but she will be joining us sometime via Zoom. We see our agenda for today. If you would, please pay attention to item uh, bullet two, the review of the parking lot. After talking with staff this morning, I'm going to ask every council member, like we normally do, if you have any additional parking lot concerns if you will place those parking lot concerns on the sticky note that is at your desk and you can take that sticky note and place it behind me on the board it will not be a full blown out discussion today about your item but at least let council know what it is and it will be our plan that staff will respond to your sticky note concerns by our May 28th meeting. Please, 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 council, this is very important for us as we try to uh, have our budget finalized by the 30th of June. In the next couple of weeks, we're gonna have a spotty council Okay, several are going out of the country. The mayor and the mayor pro tem, uh, along with our city manager, are going to be out working for uh, the city and other states. And we will not be coming back together as a full council until June the 3rd. So it's very, very important if you have a work, a, a uh, parking lot item, please write it down and 
um, whenever we get to bullet two, if you raise your, if you will press your button for our uh, control panel, I will look at you, call your name, and then you can explain what it is very briefly, and staff will have the answers to our parking lot concerns on the 28th of May, just like they're going to have the answers tonight from our last, I mean, answers this afternoon from our last uh, meeting of last week. Can I get an okay? okay? Okay. So we now would turn it over to Mr. Yates as we start with the review of the and opening questions that he had and and, with his answers. And thank you, um, Councilman Hare. Um, he said it perfectly. Um, if you could also put your name or initials on it so if we have questions and follow up, we can um, check back with you. But um, there will be um, um, a check in. And for the parking lot, as, as Councilman Hare said, it's, uh, for us, it's things that you want to see more of in the budget, things that you can live without in the budget, or they're just questions that you have about the budget. Um, and um, if you'll write them down and um, just again initial them or make sure we can follow up with you if you have any questions. But thank you for that, sir. And we will um, try to move as quickly as we can this afternoon um, so we reserve as much time as we can for questions you have. But Jeffrey? Thank you, Mr. Manager, and thank you, Councilman. So um, I apologize we had to collect your presentations. I accidentally printed the wrong one. So we're getting you fresh copies. They'll be nice and warm when they come down. Uh, as the Councilman was referring to, the, today's agenda, we're going to review your open questions. We're going to take a look at the existing parking lot items. Um, then we're going to look at the general fund departmental budgets. Some of that will get covered in the questions as well. We'll look at a revaluation sensitivity analysis and look at what the possibilities are related to reval. We're going to do a quick review of the sales tax impact. We'll look at CIP, TIP highlights, which is the capital and technology improvement plans. Then we want to look at the uh, municipal service district budget. This is the central business district of the downtown district. And then come back to, at the end, parking lots and questions. So um, any one of these items, there's, there's a lot to it. If you want additional information, there's, staff will make time and always has time to kind of go over that in more detail with you other than um, if you decide you want a little bit more than what we give you today. So we're happy to do that. So you should have at your seats these two documents, one marked May 10th, 9th and 10th, small group questions, and then one marked May 16th council work session questions. So I'll just draw your attention to those. The first, request, the first question we had was what are the current salaries of the city's executive level staff? So what we provided there is just the compensation of all the positions across the board. As you know, we have a couple of positions currently vacant. So the range for that position was included versus what the person in that seat is actually making at this point. The per personnel comparisons, 25, uh, the budget 25 recommended versus the 24 budgeted. That's on C9 in your document. So in lieu of uh, several pages, so we just wanted to point you to that is in C9 in your document. Um, what is the budget are taking place for Rose Hill Road Sidewalk, Johnson Street, Helen Street, and the Bonnie Dune area? So we gave you a brief update on each of those. And um, the estimated budget for Rose Hill Road is about $1.2 million, partially completed, um, and we will be opening bids here shortly. Rose Hill Road Sidewalk, the budget is 20000 and this is um, to fill that gap. Then we have, let's see. The next is Helen Street sidewalk, and this has been provided for in the GO bonds. Um, then we have the Country Club sidewalk from Murchison Road to Ramsey, um, and that's 1.1 million in uh, NCDOT funding. And then we have the Stacy Weaver Drive sidewalk from MacArthur Road to Southland Drive, and that's been awarded at 175,000, again with NCDOT funding. So um, we'll be happy to answer any additional questions but that's just a quick brief update on those. And then a question about tennis court resurfacing funds um, for 2025 and what the intent at this point is to surface Masaryk Park. And that'll begin in 2025. Are there any additional questions on those items that I, I'm happy to answer for you at this point? And we have staff here that can also help if we need clarification or anything on that. 
Okay. So to follow up, then we have the May 16th. This is a little bit, these are a few more questions than, than were received um, at the small groups. So sales tax, a question about the sales tax explanation. We'll go through that today. So we're just going to give you a little bit more in, de in detail in the presentation today so there's nothing attached. Um, Office of Community Safety funding, the increase, the really the option would be either add a penny to the tax rate, which would cover about a million and a half, or the council could look for cuts equal to 1.5 million or reductions in other areas of the budget. Um, then the next thing is when will we have a status report on the stormwater tiered system? They're currently quality controlling the imagery and working through that with the consultant. Um, the discussion will, should be prepared and ready, ready in 20, January of 2025. I will point out that in the stormwater model, um, it, the modeling and the revenue need is agnostic to rate structure, which means that any rate structure you have to have has to produce the same amount of revenue to offset. So the tiered structure will deal with how you pay for it, like how each person gets billed, but the total amount of revenue necessary from that rate structure will still need to be about the same, particularly because we have coverage requirements and we have debt we'll be issuing. The next question about um, the police department, revised versus actual, and um, some discussion of possible overexpenditure. And what you can see going back to 2020 in this case, um, the adopted budget, the revisions, which as we discussed last time, and I'll discuss a little bit more, are typically encumbrance roles. Um, the, but the police department has not overspent their budget in that time frame. Um, specialized Service Bureau explanation, and that was dealing with the combination of a number of factors um, for 25, 24 and 25, moving some things around, replacement equipment and so forth. So I'll let you guys have that explanation and, and you can um, take a look at that, uh, primarily in personnel services and so forth. Um, what happens are... Uh, when a line item says that it's from ARPA, does that mean it's one-time funding? And the answer is yes. ARPA funding will run out. It should be treated like one-time funding. The challenge will be when ARPA runs out, the program's funded with ARPA funding. That will be a policy decision of the council as to whether those are continued or we reduce the funding um, or we, we don't supplant that funding. Um, how are the 35 terminal vacancies determined? We worked closely with the police department to establish what a minimum staffing level would look like in combination with the number of police officers that can reasonably be put through a year, in a year, through the academy system. So working with the police, uh, the police chief and his team, we identified that of those terminally vacant positions, the 35 we didn't believe we would fill and we believe, didn't believe we could get those through academy and out onto the street within a year. So that was how we established that frozen number, okay? The next, what, are the co what is the cost of moving all officers to their step, to, um, to their appropriate step if we use the one year per service, or one year of service per step model? That cost is gonna be about um, just under $1.4 million. And that's in addition to the $8.2 million if we were to make the market changes. So that would put everybody, thank you, that would put everybody on their appropriate step if you were working the model of one step equals one year. And that total of those two things together is about $9.7 million. And we also had the question about um, the steps, because I believe last time we showed you the minimum and the maximum based on step zero and step 10. Um, we put the current step plan at all the different steps on the next page and we showed you what the proposed steps would be. So employees on those steps would go from, for instance, if you're at step four, $52,020, you would be, um, if you moved down and over to the new one, to the new step five, you'd be at 66.5, okay? Um, what are the comparative to our peer city departments? Uh, this is always a little challenging to do this comparison because not everybody uses a step plan like we do or have longer steps or different steps. So what we gave you was the pay grade minimum 
the midpoint and the max. Um, so in, in our system, that would be zero, um, somewhere around five, and then 10. So you're looking at Asheville, Cary, Charlotte, Concord, and so forth, and then where Fayetteville ranks in that process and the related size. So these are the cities we compared in looking at that. Is there a question, Councilman? I see no question. Okay, Council, uh, yes, sir. <laughs> Most of them can tell by the expression on my face that I have a question without me saying anything. <laughs> but my first question would be, how did we become so far behind our counterpart cities according to this chart that we're looking at? What could we have done to alleviate such a 9.6 million dollar budget increase just to become comparable? The challenge, so in a competitive market, when you're setting up market rates and determining market salary, you're always in competition. So as we establish this this year, and we're working through this information, all these other localities are doing something similar. Two years ago, as my understanding, the city led in, in its compensation for police officers. In just that two year time, because everybody else is competing for the same folks, um, they increased their rates as well. So you're kind of in this continuing upward slog of trying to compete with each other. Um, there's no perfect solution because everybody's trying to edge each other in this process. But pay plan maintenance, which means you adjust and make changes constantly, is an important component of that. And I think that that's part of this discussion we're having around the market um, study. And if I can jump on that too, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, it's always a, a careful balance that the council has played and the city has played in trying to stay competitive. Um, while we, I won't, don't know that we've led the state, we've led the region. And um, uh, even when uh, the sheriff, he has multiple, he has deputies and he has jailers, um, but we really became alarmed and um, when some of the smaller counties around us were actually paying significantly more. And it, it did appear uh, that in years past, remember this, where we actually gave raises in December and stuff like that, that was our effort to try to stay caught up. And um, my fear, and it's probably yours as well, that even with this change that we're making, the market will respond and we will find ourselves next year where we are. And that's why it's so important for the things that we're doing all last week um, and continually for law enforcement and our firefighters as well, to create an environment that makes them feel safe and at home and welcome. Because uh, we're always chasing that salary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just would like to add a comment that I feel as though with our retention being so low, if we can induce more recruitment, that this step plan would be a great opportunity for us to do it currently, because that way we will have at least most, if not the majority of new police officers on step zero, where you don't have to pay them the difference, whether they were on step six, eight, or ten. Questions before Mr. Yates goes forward? Let me ask this question, Mr. Yates. It's yes, sir. somewhat where Councilmember Tom Thompson spoke and the city manager sort of slightly alluded it to it. And you may not be able to answer this, but when I look at a city like Burlington, North Carolina, that is very, very much smaller than ours, and they are able to if I'm not mistaken, my last phone call with their commissioner, I'm thinking it was forty-five to fifty thousand dollars. Oh, it's been a while since I had that conversation. I'm thinking it was fifty, even when I heard the ad on the radio for starting for their police department. Now I know you may not be able to answer this, but when I look at a, such a smaller city that can start out more than what our beginning rate is. I just always wondered how they did that. To come up, and some of it too is um, their tax base. 
Um, they uh, penny on the tax rate generates so much in different places and they have much smaller staff. Um, they have an easier time recruiting. They're a much denser community between Burlington, Mebane, Graham, Chatham County. And so you have a density of population. And one thing about the Federal Police Department too, and this has been true of every chief I've worked for, worked with here, is that um, we are in need but we have very stringent requirements for our training and our background checks. And um, uh, I'm not saying that others don't, but um, sure. uh, Chief, if you could elaborate on, on um, Council Member Harris' question as well. So just discussing, you know, uh, amongst chiefs and, 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 and people of rank within these other jurisdictions, you know, it's a lot easier to get that page adjustment when you're dealing with 40 police officers or 100 police okay, officers okay. than when you're dealing with 430 police officers. Okay, okay. So, you know, you. What, what's going to, you know, it's going to be exponentially greater, you know, to get the, the, the revenues in to make those, those pay adjustments when you're dealing with a department our size or, or, or larger. Okay, yeah. I, I wouldn't even, didn't think that much. Even, but thank you. I, I got it. I got it. All right. Okay. Next item, sir. Okay. Moving on. We had a question that came in um, via email concerning different options around the pay increases. So uh, what you have in that first table is in the salary column, you have at one, two, three, and four percent of what a um, four percent of midpoint salary increase for the general population is for the 1% increase to the 401k and the step increase and the total. The second table is the same table with the half step increase to public safety instead of a full step increase and how much you would expect to save from that. The third is with a bonus added on. Um, I think the question actually was in lieu, bonus in lieu of, so we'll get that table updated for you um, and put in. And then we have the similar table at the half step increase along at those different percentage rates. So we just wanted to kind of give you, this is the full spectrum, if you will, from 1% to 4% of what those salary increases will cost off of midpoint. I can. So let's stay, um, let's stay with the first table that just says full step increases. So the first column, or the first um, column marked salary there, that's the, that's the cost of a, for instance, 4% off of midpoint increase for the non-sworn, non-step employees, or the non-step employees. Then the 1% of 401k, then the cost of the step increase, and that gives you a total. So what we did is we gave you, if we did 3% for all non-sworn employees, non, I'm sorry, non-step employees, this is what the cost would be at 3%, this is what the cost would be at 2%, and 1% for non-step employees. So that column marked step increase continues to honor the step. But what this would do is reduce the gotcha. percentages used for the non-step employees. You done, sir? I'm okay. Okay. I'm going to try this here. I'm going to say it. I want you to help me this because I don't know why I don't get your name right. Council member Ben Vitelli. Did I get it? I should have just left it at Mario. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll take it back. Council Member, Council Member B, please, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Hare. It's Benevente. Just like it's spelled, you can just say every letter. It's very phonetic. Um, so I guess this is, this is more of a, a statement than it is a question, you know, to my colleagues. I, I feel strongly that everyone has applied some level of logic to why we're increasing the police pay and for us to remain logically consistent we've got to be just as passionate about all of our employees so let's hold on to four percent I'm concerned about this interest in reducing the uh, raises for our uh, non-step employees um, and this idea of a one-time bonus I mean who are we who are we kidding here who are we fooling um, I think that's an insult to our staff to say, to make such a suggestion when we are talking about um, increasing salaries for our sworn uh, step folks and then all of a sudden for our uh, rest of the staff, um, you know, we're, we're trying to take it out on them at their expense. Um, so, you know, 
we have serious professionals here uh, who want to be able to speak to raises that contribute to their 401k, that contribute to their retirement. This isn't an hourly job where bonuses for you know college kids just trying to you know spend big on a holiday uh, item. Let's let's really really be careful um, playing with these numbers. I agree, sir. Any more questions on our step plans, our police, our staff concerns? Okay, Mr. Okay, Yates. So we'll continue on. Um, a question came up about fund balance usage in 2023. Um, there was no general fund balance used in 2023. Basically what that means is our revenues came in higher than our total expenditures for that year. Um, then we have a handful that we're still working on. The question about designations and encumbrance carry forwards for police department. I believe there was about three million, a little bit more than three million carried forward in between. Um, we're still working on that analysis to get it to get it to a point where we can produce that to you and it will make sense. The biggest chunk of that is going to be though um, was done with vehicles. Essentially, police cars that were on order that didn't come in, we had to carry the money between the years. So when they came in, all the equipment and everything that we needed for them and everything was ready. That's probably two thirds of that role about two million of it. So uh, the next was how much communication networking budget do we spend annually? With whom, what companies um, that were working on that? Um, subscription fees for loose leaf and yard waste. We are also working on that to provide back to you. Um, Office of Community Safety grants, our grant, how much is allocated uh, for Office of Community Safety and depart which department handled the funding? We're still working to research that one. And then water and sewer extension lines on Johnson Street. Um, we have a placeholder in the parking lot for that, but I know that uh, Mr. Lindsay is working with PwC to get some more information on that. So those are all the questions that we had from our last meeting. Um, and be happy to answer any questions about those at this point. Otherwise, we will look at the parking lot. Councilmember B. Thank you. Uh, this goes back to the front page, I guess, four questions down. Um, and, and again, I'm trying to make sure we're talking about this, and I'm using the right language. When I see that we adopt budgets for PD, and then in every revised budget, it's more, how is that not overspending? It's a good question. So um, the difference between adopted and revised, okay, the way that occurs is through some kind of budget amendment, right? So that doesn't mean that they spent that, okay? That's the actual column. That's their spending authority. So typically what happens is through the year, okay, um, your amended budget can be encumbrance rolls, which we've talked a little bit about, and I was just talking about the vehicles, which are basically contractual obligations the city has going into June that aren't resolved by June 30. Okay. That have to be paid out in the new year so our budget ends on June 30, so we have to give budget capacity to pay those contracts in the following year. So that's the, the big, that's the big one. There's always the designations process or the council appropriating additional money through a BOA no, so that, through that's, the year. Right, so because we're approving those contracts because of obvious reasons, we are, just because we're saying yes to the over, overspending the adopted budget, What's a better term to use than over? Because I'm not trying to suggest that they somehow broke the bank and it was under no one's supervision. I'm saying I get that staff, council said yes. Con it, you, uh, get those contracts reflected in the budget. So what's a better term to use? It's their amended budget. I got you. But what's a better term to use for the fact that they went over? They The amended budget is... So I think what you're asking is around the term over give okay, me a different so word yeah you you amended the adopted budget to uh -huh. add that authority to their expenditures okay. now if they had spent in that third column the actual column if that had been bigger than the adopt the revised budget or the amended budget in this case revised mm -hmm. then yes overspent would have been the right term but in this case their amended budget is higher than their adopted budget, which is typically the case. Very right, and that's my point, is that it seems to be that way every year. So when I look at, you know, was it E14, I forget exactly what page it is on, 
the current police fund summary, in the very last column, this has changed from fiscal year 24 to 25, that somehow we are going down $3.3 million. I think someone looking at that would say, wow, you guys are cutting the budget from the police $3 million. But in reality, we're budgeting them just as much as we adopted for them the, the year before. And it's very likely they're going to go over that, or not over, whatever term will make the peanut gallery feel better, that $3 million that's probably going to be, then let, let's, let's, let's make, find a better way to explain that to people. Because I know that that's possible, that people will look and say, you guys are going down $3 million. We're really not. Sure. And in the interest of that, Councilman, one of the slides we have today is I can show you that difference. Great. Um, typically, what you would compare is revised budget to recommended budget. So that's a common comparison. And to be honest, it's a, it's a mathematical equation worked out in a database. So um, I can show you today exactly what you're talking about. Great. Um, we've added the adopted column on some of the materials for today just to kind of share that with you. So happy to look at that. Um, I don't think either one's wrong. I think they're just... It's a different way to look at the information. That's fair. And I want us to be able to explain that to people who aren't looking at it from just a financial by budgetary uh, way of explaining it. Because, again, looking at that plainly, one would assume one thing. I think arming us with the ability to articulate that to folks is going gonna, is gonna to help me get this budget passed. Proceed, sir. Okay, thank you. So next we'll take a look at the parking lot. So based on the conversations we have had, if you remember, um, one of the things that we had a challenge with when we were trying to balance the budget was maintaining the right-of-way maintenance and the litter pickup crews. This is the additional amounts for that. So we, our recommendation to staff is that if we were to add, start adding things back, we would start with that knowing the, count, the city's commitment to litter pickup and keeping our um, right-of-way um, clean and clear in mode. Next was the $50,000 additional funding for neighborhood signage. So existing now, there's 25000 This would bring your total to $75,000. We had $1.5 million of additional funding for the Office of Community Safety. That's in addition to the one point five that's already in um, the, adopt, or in the um, recommendation now. And then the $250,000 additional for water and sewer extensions. And this is in that um, area around Bonnie Dune, and I believe it was Johnson, Johnson Street, if I have that right. Yep. So, um, and that's what I mentioned that Mr. Lindsay is working with PwC to get some insight as to how that would work and so forth. Just as a reminder, for every um, penny increase or decrease on the ad valorem tax rate, it's about 1.544, just a little over a million and a half. So with that in mind, let's talk about a few um, different components. So the general fund, um, today's topics, as we mentioned, we're going to talk about the other general fund departments. So Councilman, to your point, um, Councilman Benvente, you can see in this graphic the adopted budget. So if you were to look at um, the total revised budget against the recommended, we're down. If you look at the adopted budget to the recommended, we're up slightly. I highlighted the other appropriations column for you or other appropriations row because I wanted to show you this is the area where we hold the salary increases, where we've plugged the attrition number or the vacancy savings number. You see we went from 32 uh, million last year or in the revised to the 48.6. That is partially due to reduction of the vacancy savings. Remember we had 19 million last year of vacancy and efficiency this year we're talking right around eight million is what we're projecting this is also where we're holding salary increases um, and the pd salary increases and all that other so um, that other appropriations is a non-operating fund if you will or non-operating department it is a placeholder for those high level things in which we need to um, maintain control over and make transfers from and so forth it is so I wanted to highlight that to you because um, if it were a department, it's one of the biggest departments, but it's not really theoretically a department. It's a um, accounting mechanism. But other than that, what you'll see across is um, roughly everyone's about the same. The big change in the mayor, council, city clerk is related to the election. You had an election this last fiscal year. 
we won't have one in 25 until um, after we get through this budget cycle. We'll, we'll hold in July of 2025 will be your next election cycle. So with that, um, I'll be happy to answer any questions. These summaries are also in your documents. So feel free to, um, if you have any additional questions based on that, to shoot those to us. You change your mind? Thank you, sir. Um, but I feel like in everything you just said about other appropriation, you were trying to explain to me why I don't see an OCS under general fund expenditures by department right now. That's correct. Um, and that perhaps once we get things squared away next year, we will? What you would see is under the city manager's office. I see. Okay, understood. You would see that increase. Um, and the city manager's office is where you see, like, internal audit, the construction management office they're the departments that report directly to him i see and we have amended if you um in your revised materials we gave you last monday there was ocs was listed is a direct relationship to the manager thank you um but if it's the council's interest we can always show it separately but typically you see those fall under the manager's office as well as i believe spa is also included in that So revaluation sensitivity, there's a lot of conversation revals going on right now. So to be clear, kind of the impact, when we would expect to see the budgetary impact will be in the 2026 budget, okay? So right now they're going through the reval process. There is a time frame for appeals and so forth. They'll set those values as of January 1, 2025, okay? Then they'll go forward. And when you set the rate this time next year, that'll be under the new reval rate, mm -hmm. okay? Under the new valuation of that property. So what I wanted to do is show you um, at different intervals how much money we would anticipate seeing growth in our revenue at the 5895 rate, okay? So that's the recommended rate. So for instance, if we saw a 10% growth next year, what we'd see is an increase of close to $7.9 million in next year's budget, or in 2026 estimated revenue. And then it goes all the way down. I went to, the, to what I would feel would be kind of the outer bounds of the high end. At 50% growth, you would see additional $51.5 million in, in your operating budget or in those revenues. So I just want to kind of give you a magnitude. What we are hearing um, is anywhere probably between 20 to 30-ish here and there, um, the county's a little tight-lipped as can be expected. They're going through an appeals process and everything like that, that, that takes time. Um, so I would expect it to settle out somewhere around that number. So it's entirely conceivable next year that you would have um, anywhere between 15 and $26 million additional into your general fund operating budget. Hmm. So, um, and keep in mind our sales tax, sales tax loss estimated for next year is about 8.2 million. Any questions on the reval? Let's keep it moving, sir. Okay. So this is gonna get a little more complicated now. Um, this is the sales tax impact analysis. So I wanted to explain the annexation payments. And like I said, if you have questions or if you wanna talk about this in more detail, I'm happy to schedule some one-on-one -on -one time. The way the annexation payments and the agreement worked is it sets out based on actual 2020, okay? That's that first column. Yes, sir. Um, just to probably pause and, and make sure that everyone understands what the sales tax agreement was. Um, some of you know what it was and when it started, but um, is there general consensus or would you like just a two minute background on that? Okay. Um, when the city of Fayetteville did its annexation in uh, 2005, um, when we l were going and we annexed what equivalent was Goldsboro at the time, some 40,000 people, um, Western Fayetteville, um, or unincorporated <laughs> Cumberland County, um, <laughs> that had massive amounts of um, 
sewer needs and water needs that no one knew, and code enforcement too. Got a lot uh, of money out there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> we um, got that money for it. <laughs> uh, it came a time that, based now on population, um, that the differential would shift from where the city was the largest population base versus the county. Um, and under threat of changing the, um, the, the sales tax distribution formula, the city of Fayetteville um, entered into an agreement with Cumberland County whereby they would maintain um, the formula, but the city would I guess I won't say rebate is the best word, but would rebate a portion of that um, back to uh, Cumberland County that we would receive. And we make those payments quarterly. Is that correct, Jeffrey? That's correct. So the money comes to us, and then we rebate it back to the county quarterly. Where it got a little um, difficult was that in order to form the agreement as well, the county required or requested that the city also hold harmless, so to speak, the other municipalities in Cumberland County. So by virtue of the fact that we annexed, they actually got more money. Um, and so those are the annexation payments he's talking about. So not only are we paying the county to maintain the sales tax um, formula and distribution method, but we're also we're paying a portion of that back to the small towns. That was the agreement. Then we had the town of Eastover formed, and Mr. Hare will remember this, and we also had to, and they had to turn around and start writing annexation payments to everyone else too for the amount of money that they, as an entity, were now taking. And so that catches us up to today where um, the five year, last five year extension that we had under that agreement, um, the county opted to um, sever the agreement and to go straight to ad valorem, which as you've been told, um, impacts the revenue that we receive. Um, and so the annexation payments, as Jeffrey's getting ready to talk about, not only will the money that we um, remit to Cumberland County go away, which we've known about, but also the money that we pay to the small towns will go away. Um, and Jeffrey explained it to me in a, in a graphic way. And anyone who would like to spend some time with him um, and Kimberly Leonard or Jody Piccarelli and myself to actually talk about why that hole is so um, precipitous um, and what it means that we uh, and how it's impacting our budget and will continue to impact our budget. The good news is, is that sales tax is very robust. And so once we are finished and we are, um, and I think we're completely finished with it and even the step down is it next year, or you're after? In 2025. 2025. Um, then we will start to see our sales tax um, go back up, but it will be at a, at a lesser slope, um, which I think really does prove the resiliency of our, um, of our economy. But it has probably between the last couple of years and the 8.2 that he's talking about next year, would you say it's cost us about $20 million? 25. Between 20 and 25 million. Um, of lost revenue that we don't have. Um, but it does make for a simpler agreement with Cumberland County. Okay. So, just real quick to kind of build on what the city manager was talking about. And I always forget most of the time, everybody thinks when you pay at the cash register that that sales tax goes to the place you're paying from the perspective of what town you're in or where you're at. That's called a CITUS approach. Okay. So what ends up happening, the reason you have all these allocation methods is because it's only related to um, the county as a whole and the state as a whole. So when those sales tax comes in, if I ate at a McDonald's in Spring Lake, that comes in and then is distributed out based on allocation methodology. So as mentioned, to keep those small communities Hold them, try to hold them as harmless as possible for the annexation. What they did is they established a formula that said, going forward, as a base year, as 2020 the base year, whatever that growth is, we're going to split that growth up. So if you go all the way over to a column marked percentage of growth allocated from COF, City of Fayetteville, 
you see the, the, all the percentages. Those are what we share with all of those communities of our growth. So we establish in this case, if you look at quarterly 2020, which is the second column in after, or the first column in after actual in 2020, that number was 25.1 million was the quarterly base. Then in quarter one of 2024, it was 35 million. So that's a 39, almost 40% growth in sales tax. You apply the share formula, and then we distribute that distribute that yeah, growth yeah. out to all the other communities. Yeah. So the city, um, the quarter one annexation payment for FY 2024 was right at $2.6 million. Oh, just a little under two seven. Okay. In addition, we'll flip over in just a second, but the max cap now is what it was in actual of 2022. Because your new agreement, which layers on top of the annexation agreement, it's not in place of, says the county is going to reap all the benefit, 100% of the benefit from growth over the 2022 dollar value. So if we're looking then at the next page, so and I refer to it as a rebate. In 2022, our actual sales tax the city received was $45.9 million, just under $50 million. I'm sorry, 46 million. Our actual 2023 was 50 million. So out of the gate in 2024, because sales tax is growing, we knew we had already lost about just a, right around five million dollars. Okay, through March of March of 2024, we've gotten about 38 million. And then in, in 2025, we're recommending the 2022 amount. Okay. So the way that that works out is when we, when we reach 45.952, 568, then we will start paying back the county. Everything over that amount, we'll write a check to the county. And we'll bring, back, bring that back to council because I believe we'll wait till, we should wait till the books are closed and we've done all the accounting to be sure, not anticipatory payment, but pay them when we actually know the value. Right, okay? right. We also are interpreting the statute working with our city attorney's office um, that city hold harmless is excluded from this calculation. Um, hold harmless was given to the cities to replace a sales tax that was taken away. Uh, and the statute refers to no part of that should be allocated to the county and so forth. So you can see the city hold harmless growth over time. Um, we're one of the few communities that's seen growth in the hold harmless payment. Uh, so that's a positive for us. But I just want to kind of give you this quick explanation. And in 2025, any dollar we get beyond that 45, 952, 568 will continue to go back over to the county. So we're capped. Doug mentioned a trough. So we went to 2023, dropped down 5 million, level for two years, and then we'll start growing a little bit after a slight reduction again. So that's kind of the explanation of the sales tax and how that um, is working out. We haven't written them any checks for other than the annexation payments. We haven't paid them any overage and anticipation of what the, what the sales tax number will be. Okay. So any questions about that? Um, yes, Councilmember Mahondros. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Yates. Can we have the actual sales tax formula as it currently is, and then the actual sales tax formula once it converts over or transitions over to ad valerum? Absolutely. So if you'll flip over, next page. So all this to say, the two methodologies for allocation, right now the city and the county are under the per capita methodology. So total population um, that, that are being accounted for in this equation is about 590,000. Keep in mind, they, we double count the county residents um, in this case. So in this version of it, the city gets about 36.1% of the total sales tax. Um, and this county gets 57, and then you see all the different percentages. That's the highlighted yellow block. The ad valorem levy basis, which basically means value times rate, okay, it'll be based on the levy, that's how it'll change. It'll change, it'll change, but this is how it would change now. So we go from 36% to 24.5%. 
and the county goes from 57 to seven, almost 72 percent. Um, and you can see the little, uh, some of the smaller jurisdictions, um, Spring Lake, for instance, is losing almost a percentage. Um, Hope Mills is losing a percentage in that equation because it's got a total to 100 percent. So it's impossible to take funds from one and not or add funds to one place without taking money from another. Okay, keeping in mind that as we go forward with that levy basis, any changes in our tax rate up or down will change that percentage allocation. Yes, sir. So that's kind of what I was getting at. How do we see what that looks like? That calculation really, it, you, you can only do it after the fact because everyone has to adopt their tax rates and then the bills have to be levied. So those bills hit, I believe in August, the levy, the levy calculations come out and I think you certify your levy. Once that's done, then the Department of Revenue goes through the calculation of putting this together. And then they'll distribute sales tax based on that um, basis. So other than that, it's conjecture. We can say, what if, you know, everybody held equal and we did X, what does that look like? Um, but it's really hard to predict. In addition, with reval coming into the equation, it's really hard to predict what that breakout will be. Right, I understand. Thank you. So, and I had requested um, kind of peer city reviews of our county and municipal tax rate combined, and then how that compares with peer cities. Is that forthcoming, or do I need to yes, submit we'll a sure, different email? We'll be sure it gets added. All right. Thank you. Council Member B. What, what do you have want a question, the, sir? Yes, sir. Dina, what, what do you want the Pure Cities for again? Try to understand. What's the big one? I mean, we can talk about it now. We can talk about it offline. Talk about it. Yeah. When you say levy basis, what are we talking about exactly? Okay, so when you take your property value, total and property value, uh, or in this case, um, yeah, total property value, and you take your tax rate and you push those together, that gives you your levy amount, or essentially the revenue number, right? So um, for we talk about it in pennies. So you take the value of a house, divide by 100, and multiply them by the number of pennies, and I'm that sorry. gives you your levy in, in that case. So it's the total levy. Okay, so that, that column... In, well, there's, there's two white columns on the far right. That dollar figure in Fayetteville is 73 million? Correct. We're saying that that's the total. I'm and again, I'm asking this question as I'm articulating to people what ad valorem is based on. It's the total value of properties in the city of Fayetteville? Correct, times the rate. Times the tax rate. Yep, so that's the amount of property tax we bill. Understood. Okay. And you're done? Yes, sir. And because we are where we are now, the county is doing those uh, evaluations now. Right. Okay. They're evaluating right. the value of the property. Yeah. And right. then after that valuation comes in, it'll be up right. to the council to debate the rate. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Any more? Yes, council member. I'm Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So to kind of piggyback on all of that, including your question, councilman, um, without having the municipal tax rates of each municipality in Cumberland County, right? To your point, that's until August or later, once all those have been adopted, it's all conjecture or all projection at this point. But would it be safe to say that the higher Fayetteville's municipal tax rate, the higher that is, the larger our share future share of the sales tax distribution will be. That would be correct. And would it also be safe to say that that was never true with the previous formula? Like this is a new, this is a new uh, cause and effect. This is a new effect of, of this change in the sales tax distribution. That's correct. It was all based it was on population. Formula. Yeah, it was on population then. Yeah, yeah, so this right. is something for my seasoned members of council, two of which aren't here today. This is something, a phenomenon that none of us have ever seen before because it's never happened before. Correct. That's what I want to make clear to my colleagues on council, which is one of the main reasons I want that 
data. Moving forward. Okay. Council? Yes, sir. Please. All right. So moving on to the CIP um, technology improvement plan, I'll just draw your attention to a couple of pieces. Their detailed project pages are detailed in your book. Um, they kind of go through each of the projects. But I want to point out um, we have about 793, almost $794 million of projects either um, appropriated prior to or planned for the um, through 2030, through 2030. So that's a pretty big chunk. The biggest one in that group is through the airport. It's about 300 million. Um, you have the fire, which includes all the public safety, um, the fire pieces of the public safety, that's about 56 million. You have the police. The biggest chunk of that is the 911 um, call center. Uh, and that's right around 43, almost 44 million um, in total across that time. It's not the only piece, but that's a big driver. In their, in their cost. Public services has about 115.8 million. That includes streets um, and all those different projects. Then you see stormwater is at 151 million, and we talked about that um, last Thursday in great detail. So I just wanted to kind of give you this breakout by department, um, and we can certainly bring back any more detail that you would like to see. But next year, we're recommending about 125.6 million. And I wanted to mention kind of our strategy for this process. What we really wanted to do was focus on completing the projects we have in the hopper. Finish the projects as they were intended, on time and on budget. So we didn't add a lot of construction other than bonds, stormwater, streets, that kind of thing. We really focused in on maintenance and um, what I would refer to as renewal and replacement projects. So you see things, um, like in Parks and Recreation, you see that $100,000 out over that time and it kind of grows incrementally based on a growth estimate. That's for uh, resurfacing of tennis courts um, and any park amenities that have to be replaced in that time frame. Same thing in IT. We have money built in, level, what I would refer to as level loaded, to ensure we can replace our computers, network infrastructure, um, all those components. We worked with the, the fire department to get them on an apparatus replacement schedule. They already had one, but in lieu of paying cash, we're looking at funding that with lease payments. So we're ensuring that they have the apparatus that they need. And if you were looking at the fire department's total of that 14 million, um, there's about 4 million of it, give or take, is apparatus, which are the fire trucks. So really what we try to do is create a sustainable and achievable capital plan over the window that we're showing here. Okay, and that amounted to right at 790, again, almost 70, uh, $794 million worth of projects. And that's really aggressive. But I think what, um, what the really good news is, and I will jump to the next slide. When you look at the CIP over that window, and I'm not referring to past funding, but new funding going from 25 to 30, about 314 million of that total, or roughly about 50%, or I'm sorry, 63% is funded with federal funds, federal and state funds, grant funds. So that's a really large number that we are planning, and that comes from our stormwater. A big chunk of that's our airport. So of the aggressive capital program in some of those areas or of that program, we're really getting funding from outside the city. Another 95.5 million, or about 19%, are paid through user fees. Okay, so that's um, a lot of those stormwater projects. We'll take out revenue bonds and so forth, and we'll pay for those if there was revenue bonds. And then about 90 million is supported through ad valorem taxes. Those are things um, like the geo debt, the park um, tennis court resurfacing, fire trucks, your infrastructure, um, replacement of the CAD system, continued replacement and renewal of our police cameras, body worn camera program and all those different components. So if we flip back one page, you can kind of see how that breaks down across all those different sources of funding, starting with 2025. So remember, general fund pay go, anytime you see pay as you go, that's essentially current revenue being used. Anytime you see um, 911, POW bill, NCDOT, those are state monies coming to us or federal monies. And when you see revenue bonds, those are funded 
out of the revenues of that system. So for instance, stormwater is, a, is the best, is a good example of the only place we have programmed revenue bonds. So um, this is just kind of a quick funding breakdown, but I think it provides you a good sense of our capital program over the time that we're looking at. And I'll be happy to answer any questions at this point. Uh, before I go to, okay, I see his name going. You're not, before I go to council member Thompson, if he still wants, uh, has a question, let me ask you this. As we look at the CIP, now this is just a, this is just a conversation. All right, we are in money crunch time as you, uh, this year as we were last year. This is just for conversation. The, the OCS we're giving, or the discussion to put 1.5 mil startup, and I think, I think the request from Councilmember B is to go forward to the four mil eventually, correct? Okay, so my question is this. Oh, three, okay, three, three. So my question is this, just, just for conversation. Since we do not have the organization structure yet for OCS, and we, if it's budgeted this budget season, uh, the 1.5 million, what if that was put in the OCS, just for conversations team, in the CIP, and then whenever it's structured, the position is structured, then we budget it in the CIP then. Just for conversation, if that's something that can't be answered now, I'll write it down and put it on the board. I think, um, so. You understand what I'm asking? I do. I think my understanding of what you're asking, let me repeat it back to you, is how can we take that funding and put it in a place so that if it doesn't get spent, it gets carried to the next year and eventually used for OCS, even though we may not get it stood up and spent in the current budget year. So we can absolutely do that if that's the council's wish. Um, it will just become through the budgetary role, if you will, of doing that. Um, so if you do it, you can do that with any source of funding. So if you wanted to dedicate, for instance, ARPA funding, we have additional ARPA funding that, that's come available or could come available. Um, if you wanted to use that funding, we can go between the fiscal years if that's the council's direction and wish, we can absolutely make that happen. You've got a history of doing that in some cases, um, particularly with the Black Voices Museum and the um, Civil War Museum. So, yeah, just, just I was just throwing it out there as far as absolutely. conversation. But now, but let me ask this: though. I want to make sure I'm understanding. You said that we are trying to. I can't remember the exact wording that you stated, but um, some of our brick and mortar things that we're already that's in the harbor. Are, and I'm thinking their money should already still be aligned. So Fire Station 14, the tennis and the uh, pickleball courts, th that's old money still sitting there, already there. Correct. We that's didn't. Not a, th okay. That's okay. existing appropriation. Okay. So this, okay. this schedule. That's not one of the items. Right. So okay. those are continuing to be funded until the project's closed. Any money that's already been put to them or any new money that we believe necessary to complete the project. Mm -hmm will be added or has or is being added through this CIP. So we're not reducing those projects or not proposing reductions in those projects. Okay, we're gonna to go to Council Member Thompson and then Council Member B. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick question. I heard you mention in the CIPs the 911 call center. Is that also is that also part of the uh, uh, CIP funding that we will potentially use? For the 911 call center, or is it's that included in your capital plan already? There was a big chunk of it funded in 2024, so that money is that capacity and money is already planned along with the tax rate that was planned for that purpose. Thank you, sir. You included certain questions that people have emailed about. You didn't include any question. You didn't include the question that the mayor had included related to cutting out the E911 call center and just paying the county some kind of annual fee. 
is that something that we're going to see calculated in a future budget meeting and how if we decide to go that direction how that will impact this year's budget um, we will gather that information I think that we're still waiting on a response from Cumberland County um, to that um, but at present um, because if we go that direction the money that you were talking about encumbered really okay we'll see if uh, we get more information on that I guess at some point before June 10th that was um, the direction mm -hmm. that the mayor requested from um, the county yes mm. okay well uh, this part I have to say what kind of impact would that have on staff here will be part of the question that I hope I can get information back next time. As it relates to uh, Councilmember Harris' suggestion, the one and a half million that's currently budgeted, I cannot have anyone here touch. Now, when it comes to the additional one and a half that I'm hoping to get budgeted for things that I believe Councilmember Banks McLaughlin had articulated, she wants to see some gun violence stuff that Mayor Colvin has said he wants to see some gun violence programs. They're thinking about stuff that we have yet to identify that I think also deserves money. So perhaps, instead of having my additional one and a half million be in literal cash, that can be CIP money. Because just as you said, Councilmember Hare, is yet to be identified what Mayor Colvin and, and others um, mean by focusing on gun violence. We do have one and a half million currently already allocated in a balanced budget that can go to alternate response. Mm -hmm. That cannot move. But the additional one and a half that I think that other people have other ideas for, that could be CIP. And just for clarity, any, Councilman, uh, um, any money you put in the CIP still comes from somewhere, right? The CIP doesn't have separate funding. So if we were to identify it, a CIP is a mechanism to carry it between years. So in this case, if you were to identify one of the places you could get that as an additional uh, funding from ARPA, you can get it from additional tax dollars, but it still has to come from somewhere. The CIP is not in and of itself a funding source. Yeah, but the CIP is not the CIP items that are in the CIP unless they are already been uh, allocated for. Th there's no real money with those right then that are in the CIP, right? They're not, they are not actual budget brick and mortar spending money. Am I understanding that correct? The, for instance, in this case, recommended 2025, the money set into 2025 would be starting to be spent in 2025. So that's real funding. The, all the funding included in the CIP is real, legitimate, planned funding. Okay. But Councilmember here, you are correct. If there's something that shows up in the CIP for 2028, it may not have any money. It is a placeholder, and it is how you are forecasting that you will spend the money, mm -hmm. but that may change as funding. Right. As it comes forward in the years. Yes. Okay, where are we now, uh, Mr. Yates? I, I see us at the review. Yep, we're, well, we're at the Central Business Tax District. So there's been some questions related to the Central Business Tax District. Um, I've had some conversations with the Cool Spring um, downtown folks. So I just wanted to kind of th put this in front of you. We are recommending a 21, uh, I'm sorry, 11.1 uh, cent tax increase. And I just wanted to illustrate the vast majority of the funding for the district goes to contractual services, which is to pay for the Cool Spring Downtown District um, operations. So the general fund is not taking funds off of this. This year's budget is structured to be self-supporting. Um, there are no events funded after, out of this. All the events are funded through the general fund, um, not through the downtown district. So I just wanted to kind of bring that uh, and show the council or demonstrate um, kind of where that's at. And we anticipate um, having just a slight negative fund balance. So for, for all intents and purposes, keeping it kind of zero um, and, and pushing out all that money into the district um, as the design of a municipal service district is. And when you look across um, 10 of the 51 municipal service districts around the state have a higher rate than that 21.1 in 2024. Um, the max is 27 cents. The median is about 10 cents, 10 and a half cents. And there are several that are probably defunct but haven't gone off the books, which are at zero. Um, so that kind of skews a little bit. But 
I wanted to give you that quick analysis because there are some questions and I know you may get questions about it, so I wanted to put that in front of you. Okay. Okay. And so the final piece, as you mentioned, Councilman, is the review. So we have the parking lot items. Again, we have the 500 to maintain right-of-way maintenance and litter pickup, 50,000 additional for neighborhood signage, one and a half million for Office of Community Safety, and then 250,000 possibly for water and sewer extensions. Um, and you all have post-its in front of you, so I'll be happy to answer questions, or if you want to put some more questions or uh, parking lot items for us, we'll be happy to get those together for you for next Tuesday evening. Okay, sir. Um, is this new question, Council Member B and Council Member Thompson? Yes, sir. Okay. In that order, please. Can you go back one slide? I might have emailed this question already. Um, public safety grants that people were applying for through ECD, is that been, I know I think for this fiscal year, it's tapped. Is it already in the budget for the next fiscal year? We are doing that research right now okay. uh, based on the grant opportunities. It's on the list at the last handful oh, was of questions. It? That have we haven't finished yet. Okay, it's a TBD. Okay. Yep. Well, I guess if it ends up not being included, then I guess I would make that a parking lot item. So should I just go ahead and write it down now? Um, if you would please. All that right. way, if we if it's duplicate, we'll fix that. But if not, it'd be, we'll be sure we get it. Councilman Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a simple question: When you went over the step plan, you never said where we can get that one point three eight two million dollars from to get them on the correct step so that's just again it's like the uh, funding for the OCS so the council um, has several options you can make reductions in other areas or you can add additional revenue through the tax rate so it's a little bit more a little bit less than an entire penny gotcha um, thank you sir okay so our next events that we have okay one more question oh, sir another question uh, Councilman Hondros. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This isn't um, necessarily on material we covered today, but if, if um, in our budget, the big budget book, proposed budget book, on D10, it's got a parking fund summary? Yes, sir. <clears throat> if I'm reading this correctly, is it costing the city projected one million and ninety-eight thousand in twenty twenty-five. D ten. So that question so, again. On page D10, it talks about the parking fund summary, and I'm probably looking at it wrong. That's why I wanted to ask the question. It looks like it's costing us, costing the taxpayers a million dollars. I want to make sure that that's accurate or inaccurate. So the operation of the fund is a little over a million dollars, almost 1.1 million, and that um, is made up of functional revenue, um, which is the fines, fees and other things and then other financing sources. So you're correct to operate the program, which is fully funded through their rates and fees, not the debt service on the gar not the debt services on the garage, but the just the operational side of that is about 1.1 million in total. So yes. Well, how much is coming out of parking fees that we're collecting? How much is coming out of the general fund? All of the parking fees go to the parking fund. Are we subsidizing it with any general fund dollars or is it self-sustaining? I believe it's self-sustaining. Hold on, I'll tell you. Oh, actually. And Jeff, if we can, let's um, yeah, get that because there are um, also um, charges that go back to uh, for the Franklin Street debt and there are charges that go for the Hay Street deck. And then I think this is the last year of the parking equipment that we have downtown. And so it's uh, more, um, may require a little bit more than what we can say on the fly. Okay, well at some point, 
uh, would like to talk about that. Yes, sir. We will add that to our next list. Okay, team. Uh, I see no more questions. If I could just do a friendly reminder that uh, in your package that was given to us today, uh, you see what our deadline is and what we're up against with uh, so many council members going to be out of place. So as far as getting a positive response for the 28th, if, I think uh, it would be good if we can get any additional parking lot questions in by Thursday. That would give staff enough of time uh, to uh, research it and whatnot and have a positive or have a response for us on on Monday, if there's nothing else. Great meeting, Mr. Chair. Okay, we'll call for an adjournment. Till Tuesday.